Chris, are you ready? Yeah, I'm a viewer. Yeah. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, as always, uh, welcome the colleague and friend all over the world um, to this World River and Delta System Source to Sink webinar series. And this webinar series, uh, this semester is called sponsored by uh, NSF, NC State, Louisiana State University, and the State Key Lab of Estuary and Coastal Research and uh, uh, Utrecht in, in Netherlands. So uh, today we invite Professor Chris Hackney come here to talk about the sand mining in the lower Mekong River. As we all know, the Mekong River, particularly the Mekong River Delta, face, uh, is facing so many problems. We know the sediment reduction because of the human impact of the dam, and also subsidence, saltwater intrusion, coastal erosion, coastal retreat. In the past year, we have already have uh, four, four or five talks about the Mekong River. So today, Chris will talk about the sand mining. So that's a very, very important challenge, not only in the Mekong, but uh, in the whole South Asia area. So before uh, we, uh, I introduce Chris, as always, uh, this talk and all previous talk have already uh, live streamed and archived on our YouTube channel. So you can visit just tinyurl.com slash S2S talk. And uh, at the same time, if you are active on the social media, as you can see, we have a Twitter account called source to think so you can follow us. So every week we will tweet, we will send a notice about uh, the coming talks. You can, you can get informed. So uh, um, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, uh, same time, uh, we will have Sam Bentley come here talk about the submarine landslide and morphodynamics of Mississippi River Delta Front. So please mark your calendar next week, September 15. Sam Bentley come here talk about the Mississippi River Delta. So uh, Chris, as I uh, mentioned, uh, Chris is coming from Newcastle University, uh, UK. And he is a fellow called NUACT. I did Google this. It's kind of Newcastle University academic track fellow. And he uh, have a lot of freedom. And uh, he can basically do whatever he wants scientifically. That's uh, great. Uh, so uh, as you can see, he graduated uh, battery and PhD from University of Southampton working on climate change, sea level rise on coastal line. And now he's a, uh, he's a system professor, so he's a professor, I don't know which kind of rank, but uh, something like that. Uh, so his research is a high resolution data set from field work, remote sensing. And I try to understand the morphodynamics of fluvial, deltic and coastal systems, and also the impact of human activity. So today, I think he will talk about lots of human activities and also combined remote sensing satellite image and artificial intelligence technology. So I think I already said to a lot. Uh, Chris, now is your turn. Please share your screen and put presentation mode. Right. Uh, thanks, Paul. Let's see, is that? Yes, it's good. Does that come up? Excellent. Uh, Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Um, yeah, the acronyms that our universities use over here are terrible. So uh, thanks. And I, I really wish I had freedom to do whatever I want, but unfortunately, that's never the case. Um, well, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, and, and thank you to Paul for organising this amazing sort of webinar seminar series over the past year or so. I'm delighted to be part of this and talk to you about some of the research that myself and uh, I've been doing with colleagues ar around the world, looking at the impacts of, of, of human activities on, on the Mekong River. Uh, and in particular today, 
I want to talk about the impacts that, that sand mining is having um, and how we can start to monitor and, and map sort of rates and locations of this activity throughout uh, large river systems deltas um, in the Mekong, but, but thinking more broadly, kind of bigger picture other systems in the world as well. Um, I should say now that this work, although my name is here, is a um, combination of work that's been done with colleagues here in the UK at, at, at Southampton, at, at Hull, Exeter, um, uh, over in Illinois, and also in, in Cambodia and Vietnam, where we've got uh, really good links with local sort of institutions there. So just a tip of the hat to, to everyone that's been involved in this. It's not just uh, my own work. Um, so what I want to do first is just really demonstrate the sort of scale of the problem in terms of, of why sand and, and why the mining of sand from river systems is, is becoming such an important issue in many of the world's rivers and, and delta systems. Um, and there are two papers that have been published within the last two, two months or so, uh, both in one earth, so as Torres et al. and Ben Dixon et al. That, um, really shed light on the pressures on the global sand resource and particularly looking sort of historically back over the past sort of 10, 20 years or so at how our rates as a society in general have just increased dramatically um, and how sand pretty much underpins most of, of everyday life from, from concrete and glass fiber optic cables, which are allowing me to, to do this presentation now um, through to uh, aggregates for construction and, and, and industry. Um, you can see that the sort of projections over the coming sort of 30 years or so suggest that sand, gravel and crushed rock and other aggregates are, are going to increase by the greatest percentage uh, within that time. And there's a, a global distribution to this, as we can see in the, in the, the top right there, um, that's showing aggregate imports uh, by country. Um, and that's just obviously show, depicting this sort of global trade of, of sand and aggregates. Now, obviously there are what we've termed in the, in the paper that Meta Ben Dixon led as, as sort of active and passive sources, where active sources consist of rivers and delta systems that are being replenished by natural transport and erosional processes. Um, those passive sources are, are perhaps more sort of floodplain quarries and um, open pit quarries that are, that are crushing stone. And it's those active sources where the sustainability of those systems are being um, is judged by the sort of balance between input and, and extraction, where the biggest pressures on the environment are, that, uh, are happening. In fact, across the world's surface, only 0.5% of the Earth's surface is, is a river or a delta, uh, and there is a vast sum of sand and gravel being extracted from that proportion of the Earth's surface. So it's quite an acute pressure on a really, really a set of really important uh, ecosystems. Um, and these pressures aren't unique to, to say somewhere like the Mekong. Um, this recent diagram by a paper by Jim Best and Steve Darby summarizes a range of uh, anthropogenic stresses that our global waterways are under, undergoing. Um, you can see that all these stresses operate within bounds of regional and Sort of international governance and modulated by economic, political, and social shocks. Um, and they operate over a range of timescales. And I've highlighted there that the sediment mining and dredging is, is one of those that's been identified here um, that leads to a sort of decreasing sediment flux. And there's been a series of seminars uh, within this group of seminars that have highlighted decreasing sediment fluxes uh, in, the, in the world's rivers and deltas. Um, so it's one of a combination of factors that's that's really affecting these river systems, but it is a really important and perhaps under kind of appreciated um, impact on these systems. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's skipping to to the Mekong. Um, for those of you who are perhaps less familiar with the Mekong, um, it flows for four and a half, five thousand 5,000 kilometers, draining the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, it flows uh, through Yunnan province in China uh, and then crosses down into to Laos along the border with Myanmar and Thailand. 
and then down into Cambodia and, and Vietnam before debouching out into the, the South China Sea at the Delta uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the lower Mekong is traditionally composed of the area uh, downstream of China, so sort of Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, and really the focus of what I want to talk today is on the, the predominantly alluvial reaches of the lower Mekong, so that being the sections within Cambodia and Vietnam, where, where sand uh, is, is quite a, a, a prevalent um, upstream of the town of Krachi that's marked there on the, the left-hand panel, um, there's a big bedrock section. So it's really only south of that point that we get the large expanses of, of floodplain and, and, and delta building out. Over the past 30 years, 40, 50 years or so, um, this region has undergone major economic development, um, both in terms of its use of aggregates. So the, the sort of pie charts on that left there represent volumes of extracted material estimated by a study conducted in 2013 um, by Jean-Paul Brevard et al. Um, and you can see that at, at that point back in 2011, when the surveys were taken, uh, in Cambodia, it's around 33 million tonnes a year. Down in Vietnam, around 12 million tonnes a year of, of aggregates being removed from the river channel. And that was being fueled by development in, uh, in Cambodia, around Phnom Penh, down on the delta in, in uh, cities like Canto, uh, and a bit further away, just off the delta in Ho Chi Minh. In the centre panel, um, it's showing the locations of uh, existing and um, future projected hydropower um, across the Mekong Basin, um, uh, with the percentages showing if the full build-out scenario is um, imagined, what the percentage decrease in sediment load to the delta, uh, what the trapping potential behind those dams would be in terms of sediment load to the delta. So again, it's just given this picture that the basin itself is very highly developed and with this hydropower development across the catchment, Sand is sand and other sediment is being being trapped and held back on its way down to the delta. And then finally, on the right hand panel, um, looking at population density across the across the basin, um, you can see that the the darker red colours there are predominantly located around the delta and this alluvial zone down in Cambodia. So, building up this picture that there's a lot of development pressure on the resources of the um, of the region. And that the populations that are being supported by that those resources are located in the alluvial reaches and down on the delta that are perhaps the most vulnerable to the impacts of this activity. We just have a quick look at what this sort of development looks like. Um, here's two Google Earth snapshots of Phnom Penh uh, on the left from the turn of the century of 2000, where the population of Phnom Penh was just over a million people. And then skip forward 20 years on the right, we can see how the city has expanded and built out um, as an, an effectively doubled in population up to 2 million people over those 20 years. And with that comes the need for infrastructure, for, for housing, for um, services and a, and a whole load of other uh, important parts of sort of social development. Uh, and that requires a lot of sand. Um, and this is an image taken last year. Uh, non pen in the background there. So the, the river at the front of the image is uh, the Mekong, and then the Basak, which is the first distributary of the Mekong Delta heading off uh, into the background at that, that sort of confluence, diffluence location there. And we can see the construction that's going on at this location where they're infilling uh, around a 200 metre out from the banks uh, section to build new land in Non Pen to help the city grow. Um, and I'm nominally calling this the Great Mekong Grain Drain um, because they are using all the sand that's being come, coming from the riverbed next door to it um, to, to infill and, and build this out. And just for scale there, um, those dredging boats, the, the blue boats with the green lids are around 70 metres in length. Um, and there's some nice uh, delta and fan systems in there and they're filling out uh, themselves. So there's a real drive, uh, particularly again, increasing over the last sort of two, three years for sand and aggregates in the Mekong. This is having a real impact on the sustainability of the existing sand resource. And some of the work that 
I've been leading and involved with over the last few years has looked at trying to quantify that. Um, and in its very simplest terms, we can quantify or try to assess the sustainability of the sand resource uh, quite simply using this, this sort of sand budget equation um, that came out of a paper that we published back in 2020 in Nature Sustainability. Um, so here we have uh, SRES, which is the available sand resource, um, being able to the mass of sand in storage, uh, plus a, the difference between the incoming sand supply and the rate of extraction. So it's just a very simple budget um, between what's coming in, what's going out and, and what's left. Um, and then the sustainability of the system is some function of uh, societally perceived limits on that balance between uh, income and extraction, i.e. How, how long can you live with degrading ecosystems as a society uh, and a function uh, of time. Um, so in the rest of the talk, I, I want to focus on these two because this is really where my research has been uh, focused over the last few years. So quantifying incoming sand fluxes and then quanti better quantifying and getting a better hand on the rates of extraction, which is, uh, as we'll see, tricky and, 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 and murky waters in, in some respects. So uh, if you first take a look at the, how we sort of quantify incoming sand supply, um, the majority of sediment that's being transported down the Mekong River um, is transported in suspension. Um, there's for a series of field campaigns that we conducted as part of a, a project led out of the University of Southampton that was funded by uh, the UK uh, National Environment, Environment Research Council. Um, we had a series of field campaigns over a two or three year period where we collected a range of suspended sediment sand, uh, suspended sediment samples and quantified grain size and, and fluxes uh, throughout uh, the portion of the, the alluvial Mekong River in Cambodia. Um, so you can see Phnom Penh located um, here at the, the apex of the delta and the, the link with the Tonle Sap Lake and our range of sites up there. Well, of the suspended um, sediment that we collected, only around 7% of that uh, comes out in the sand fraction. The vast majority of it, the sediment being transported is silts and clays. Um, on top of that, if we look at estimates of, of where extraction is happening, um, it's happening in this part of, of the river. We think back to that, the, um, image from Jean-Paul Brevard uh, and his team, it was Cambodia that had the, the biggest volumes of extraction. Now, obviously there's another component to sand transport and that's, that's bed load transport. Um, so obviously the total sand budget of a river is the combination of sand and um, bed load and suspension. So to quantify uh, the bed load components, screen needs to flip through, there we go. Um, we ran a series of multi-beam echo sounder surveys, at a range of sites up through the Mekong, uh, across a range of flows, and, and through bed form tracking through these repeat multi-beam images, as you can see cycling through on the screen here. Uh, over a period of about 12 to 18 hours, um, we can calculate rates of, of, of movement and, and volumetric uh, transport rates uh, at various locations in the river, and then average those to get um, sort of reach scale bed load transport. The image on the right with the, uh, the bed load flux graph, the banded period in, uh, in light blue there shows the range of discharges and bed load transport rates at which our samples covered. So we covered uh, around 75% uh, of all bed load uh, flux events. We missed the really high events um, simply because it's almost impossible to to judge when a, a high flow like that is, is going to come through. Um, but we were lucky, in some respects, lucky to get uh, some surveys on a, on a discharge of 55,000 QMAX. Um, integrating that out across the hydrograph over the period 1980 to, to 2015, um, we get a bed load flux that on average equates to around 0.17 um, million tonnes a year. Now, the suspended sand fraction of around 7% um, comes out around 6 million tonnes. So the total sand load for the Mekong River um, from our estimates is around 
just over 6 million tonnes a year. So what about the rates of extraction? Um, how does that compare to, to what this incoming sand flux is, is like? Um, well, the prior existing estimates for much of the MECOM come from this report and these surveys in, in 2011 that were reported in 2013 by Bravadatel. Um, and what they suggest is that across the entire Mekong Basin, around 56 million tonnes of sediment um, is being extracted. Uh, and just to remind you that the incoming sand load that we estimate is around 6 million tonnes. So even back in 2011, it's nearly uh, eight to nine times the, um, the volume of sand coming in that's being extracted at a basin uh, scale. The majority of that comes from Cambodia, uh, where about 32 million tonnes um, being extracted. That's followed by about 12 million tonnes down in Vietnam and, and 7 million tonnes up in Cambodia. And these estimates are so from 2011, so they're now 10 years old, um, in a basin that's been seeing major economic development. So it's likely that these are, these are underestimates. So the challenge then becomes how can we update these estimates uh, and provide a tool that allows us to rapidly monitor um, changes in mining intensity and location uh, at timescales greater than sort of revisiting every 10 years. Um, and the answer comes in the form of high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, this is some of the work that myself uh, and a colleague Magdalena Schmi have been leading up at Newcastle. Um, and just an example here, we can see from some high resolution Google Earth imagery, and then taking sort of planet scope, uh, three meter, four meter resolution imagery. Um, it's now possible with the, the satellite technology that we have to be able to identify vessels within river channels um, and, and locate them, um, particularly when you have satellites that are providing return uh, periods of every day or two days as planet scope does. So we have a satellite archive now that we can, we can look back through. Um, so we've taken two approaches here. The first approach um, that's just been published in, in our surface dynamics um, was again working in this is stretch in Cambodia, where the majority of large river traffic that can be identified in the satellites um, can be or is uh, related to, to sand mining activities. Um, there's not much sort of container traffic or, or international trade traffic in these reaches of, of the Mekong. So the vessels that we see, we can be confident are, are sand mining. Um, uh, and what we can see here on the, on the left is uh, panels B and is showing a, a zoomed in image of one of the planet scope uh, images that we use. And then panel C is showing some uh, metrics that we've extracted from Google Earth imagery. Uh, so we have the length of the vessel and the widths of the vessel and then the lengths and the widths of the hold uh, where the sand is actually filled in. And then below that in panel D, we have the distributions of each of those sizes. Um, so you can see that on average, the, the, these vessels are around 60 meters in length um, and around 10, 15 meters in, in width. So on a three pixel, three meter pixel satellite image, we can quite clearly identify these as in multiple pixels. Um, and in this, in this work, we used monthly composite images. Uh, so they're cloud-free monthly composites uh, going back from January 2016 up to January 2021. Uh, and manually digitized uh, the locations of each of the vessels that were seen in each monthly composite image. So in the graph on the right, we've got, we've got two lines. The, the red line there shows the number of, of active vessels. Uh, and we define an active vessel by any vessel that is uh, 100 meters away from the riverbank. And uh, that's to effectively remove vessels that are moored up and not, not actually uh, engaged in mining uh, around the riverbanks. Um, and then the blue line there shows the monthly water levels at, at the local gauge down in Phnom Penh. Um, and what we can see is an increasing number of active vessels over that five year, four year, five year period, um, starting off at around 40, 50 vessels per month in 2016, 
and then jumping up to around 140, 150 towards the end of 2020. So just by sheer number of vessels, uh, there's been a major sort of rapid increase in the levels of activity. Um, we see drop-offs in the number of vessels as water level rises, as conditions become um, unsuitable during the monsoon for, for mining. Um, so there are seasonal variations in this as well, that we can pick out. But having uh, then mapped each of those locations, we're able to, to plot up uh, effectively as heat maps uh, where the activity is happening. Um, these are aggregated, at, uh, uh, well, these are monthly, but here we've got just five images sort of on an annual basis. We have these for each month in the, in the, in the paper that's in uh, Surface Dynamics. Just to highlight the changing patterns of, of activity. Um, for example, in 2016, um, the, the highest area of activity was around the tip of this uh, island complex upstream of Phnom Penh. Um, but even within sort of a year, two years, this, this has shifted down, uh, downstream of Phnom Penh. Um, and then even further back in 2019, we're back up, if, uh, expanding the reach and the stretch of, of where the mining is taking place as the demand for sand in Phnom Penh increases. So we can start to then, using these, we can start to target likely locations where impacts are going to be felt the greatest. But it also, because we've got the dimensions of these vessels uh, and we know the size of the holds and the, and the area that can be filled with sand from the river, um, that allows us to back out some estimates of extraction. And if we integrate those out over the months and years that we've got the satellite images for, uh, we get these plots. So the blue plots, uh, blue bars on this graph are our estimates of extracted volume um, with error bars uh, accounting for some, some unknowns in the sort of compaction of the material within these vessels. Uh, and the orange bars on the bottom are the uh, bed load flux estimates for each of those years uh, integrated out across the, the hydrographs for each of those years. Uh, also added there are the dashed lines. Um, in the middle at, at 32 is the estimate uh, for Cambodia from Jean-Paul Brevard's group in, in, from 2011, published in 2013. Uh, and at the top is the estimate for the entire Mekong Basin from that same paper. Um, as you can see there, in 2016, our estimates from the satellite imagery are around 24, 25 million tonnes a year, which is vaguely consistent with what Bravada Tal suggest back in 2011. Uh, however, since then, um, we're seeing on average around an 8 million tonne a year increase year on year, uh, up to 2020, when our estimates for Cambodia uh, are around 59 million tonnes a year. And that is that then exceeds the basin-wide estimates um, from Bravada Tal in 2013. Interestingly, um, as well, and this is the issue of, of being able to monitor this uh, in, in different ways and at different levels and where things start to get murky, the, the official extraction figures from the Cambodian Ministry of Mines for 2019 were 14 million tonnes a year, um, which is the lower dashed line there. Um, and now, I mean, even regardless of, of the murkiness of these figures, um, that is still considerably greater than the incoming sand supply uh, as estimated at Cratchy. So even at the lowest estimates there, um, we are extracting more than the river is able to replace. If we take the upper estimates, say 59, uh, million tons a year or plus, um, we are extracting around 10 times the annual natural supply of sand at this point. That's up from around four to five times back in 2016 from those estimates. So sustainability becomes an issue and this deficit has major impacts on the morphology and the functioning of, of the river system, not just in Cambodia, but, but downstream in Vietnam, where this process is, is also going on and is uh, relatively unconstrained in terms of its, its rates and locations as well. So just what are these impacts and, and what effects are they having? Um, well, the first one uh, 
is, is the major impacts on bed morphology. In that previous image, uh, if I just go back, um, this mining vessel here is basically is two vessels. So at the front, uh, we have a vessel being filled with sand. And then behind that is a platform with four suction dredges, effectively large uh, vacuum pumps that are dropped down onto the riverbed, sucking uh, the sand off the river. If we look at the morphology of the, of the river where this is happening, um, we can see the pock marks that this suction dredging leaves on the bed morphology. Uh, so here again, this is a section of multi-beam imagery from Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Um, and we can see this area around the, um, this bar that's developed at the, um, at the confluence of the Tonle Sap River uh, is heavily pockmarked. Um, some of these pockmarks can be down to, to eight meters in depth uh, and are around 70 meters in diameter. So they're huge sort of footprints of this mining activity left on the riverbed um, that can rip out entire genes uh, and, and change this, the sort of local sediment distribution uh, around these um, critical nodes, as we'll, as we'll see a bit later, particularly this one around the Tonle Sap. Um, and within this one region alone, um, we counted 559 of these pop marks. Um, this was a survey that was taken over a course of two days in July. Um, we don't have repeats, so we can't look at how quickly these are infilling or, or redistributing sediment around this reach to, to adjust, although that's probably at the scale of, of, of months, weeks to months to, to really infill that. Um, so you can see here the distribution of these depths and, and diameters. So the, the mean depth of these pot marks is around two, three meters, and they're typically around 20 meters in diameter, but can be anywhere up to 10 meters um, in depth. We look further upstream at one of these locations where our heat maps suggest has been a recent um, hotspot of activity. Um, we can look at bed morphological changes. Um, here we have a difference of two surveys, uh, six years apart in 2013 and 2019, showing a couple of areas of, of major incision within the riverbed and, and removal of, of material, loss of material down to around five meters. If we then overlay those uh, locations of the sand mining vessels, over the period from 2016 to, to 2019, so slightly later, not covering the whole period because the satellite imagery doesn't go back to 2013. We can see that they map up quite nicely where the, the high intensity of that boat location actually maps very nicely to where we're seeing um, these major bed changes uh, and, and loss of sediment. So there's a long-term signal of incision being um, preserved in the, in, in the bed changes as a result of these um, mining activities. Across this reach, the, the median rate of bed elevation change is around 25 centimetres a year, um, the mean at around 16 centimetres a year, lowering of the riverbed as a result of loss of sediment. And that leads through um, to impacts on uh, the river banks uh, and work that we sort of, the uh, work that we published in Nature Sustainability back in 2020, um, looked at how these river banks in this section of the Mekong will change as you uh, lower the bed at different levels. Um, so what we have here on the, the top right is a, a series of bar charts that are, that are graded in color based on the change in, in bed elevation. Uh, so darker colours are greater changes in, in bed elevation, bed elevation lowering up to six metres. Uh, and the difference between the black and the green is simply that the greens are vegetated banks. Um, so we took profiles from terrestrial laser scan data on a range of sites um, and quantified the bank heights and angles, and then ran through a series of projections of, of different bed lowering. Uh, and you can see that it, it effectively only takes a three metre lowering of the riverbed to shift the majority of unvegetated banks, of which there are quite a few along the Mekong, they're, they're fairly cut um, unvegetated banks into seasonally unstable spaces. So that's a phase space at which instability is likely to be more frequent and the banks are likely to erode more. Think back to the distributions of those pockmarks with some of those being an average depth of around three meters. 
instantaneously, we might be on destabilizing riverbanks if mining is happening close to, to riverbanks themselves. More generally, if we think that the medium rate that we see in these reach scale dams of difference is around 25 centimeters a year, we're talking decadal uh, level of changes before we hit those. Bearing in mind that this activity has been ongoing for the past few decades anyway. Um, and I just want to show this video because I think it really nicely demonstrates um, the impact of increasing riverbank instability. Now, this is a video that's on YouTube. It's from downstream in Vietnam. Um, it shows the, the human loss of the power. It's quite noisy. Old. I'll turn the volume off there and, and, and talk this. Um, luckily, no one was, was hurt in this. Everyone um, was evacuated from the houses that were at risk. Um, but this location and this, this bank slide was heavily attributed to increasing mining rates by, by local communities uh, in this location at the time. Um, and it, I think it just serves to highlight that when we're talking about riverbank collapses, we're talking about loss of livelihoods and, and homes and infrastructure for, for hundreds of people. Um, so any significant shift in the rates at which these banks are eroding is important both socially and economically. There's also a range of other impacts that mining is having in the lower Mekong. Um, some of this relates again to to that location around Phnom Penh. Um, it's the confluence of the, the Tonle Sap Lake with the Mekong uh, and the start of the, the Delta. The Tonle Sap Lake here, um, Phnom Penh is, is these dots that are marked PP, PPP and PPB here in the, in the figure. Uh, so the Tonle Sap Lake is the, is the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. Um, it's the fourth most productive fishery in the world um, and is vitally important for Cambodia's uh, inland fish stock and, and provides a major source of the protein for much of Cambodia's population. It's seasonally flooded as the monsoon waters from the Mekong flow upstream into the lake um, and it then drains as water levels decrease post-monsoon um, on the Mekong. So it acts as a, a capacitor or as a buffer for the Mekong Delta, releasing more water down to the Delta during the dry seasons. Uh, this work that came out earlier this year uh, by Jin and Park um, effectively looked at changes in lake area and showed that, that over the past 40 years or so, lake volume has decreased significantly, um, as have water levels uh, in the Tonle Sap Lake and the Mekong region, although discharge hasn't. So we're seeing a lowering of water levels, but in the discharge records, that's not being kept. And they attribute these changes to two riverbed incisions driven by sand mining um, around the Phnom Penh area. You see at the bottom in panel B there, the, the Tonle Sap River and the lake is the elevation, the bed elevations there are higher than the bed of the Mekong River. And so by dredging out the Mekong River, you, you almost start to, to isolate those systems from the water within the channel itself. So you need higher flows to actually fill the lake and, and recharge that lake year on year. And that hasn't been happening with, with climate change and hydropower and all the other developments in the basin. Mining is also, mining and bed lowering resulting from mining is also a uh, primary driver of salinity intrusion further down the Mekong in, into the Vietnamese Delta. Um, this work by Islami et al a couple of years ago now showed that a deepening of, of 0.3 meters a year can can increase the tidal amplitude by a couple of millimeters a year uh, and, and increase salinity by 0.5 PSU every year. Um, and then some recent work by colleagues in Hull um, and others led by, by Greg Vassilopoulos um, has shown through a series of modeling scenarios that even if channel mining is stopped now, um, the bed level lowering that will continue 
uh, will remain the dominant driver of tidal extension into the delta for at least the next century. So it outcompetes sea level rise in terms of its importance in driving uh, tidal extension through the delta. So the impacts that we, we're seeing of this activity across the Mekong are, are long lasting. Um, it's not a case of just switching it off and being able to go back to some sort of normal. And it's also been widely reported that it's um, affecting coastal erosion rates in, in the Mekong Delta as well. Um, this is uh, predominantly over the past sort of five years, studies by Anthony et al and Lee et al, and more recently Tamur, Tamur et al, um, have placed the, the increasing and accelerating rates of erosion that are being seen along the Mekong Delta um, in a sort of longer term historical context. So looking back at the sort of last three, 4,000 years of Mekong uh, development, um, but also placing it more, more recently in terms of human activities within the basin. Um, Anthony et al. So attribute these rates of erosion to, to a few things. So there's decreasing surface suspended sediment. So reduction in sediment loads. So it's the combination of all the basin development and removal of sediment from the channel itself directly relating that to commercial large scale sand mining in the delta channels uh, and then also sub subsidence and groundwater extraction within the delta. And as Tamura say at the end, um, their paper a couple last year, that if we aim to mitigate this, we'd require substantial increases in sediment supply, well above the levels that were seen in, in 1990s. Uh, and given the, the extent of, of basin development and the extent of Sam mining, that, that's likely, not, that's not very likely. So just want to kind of finish thinking back to how we might go around monitoring this activity at sort of basin and, and wider scales, um, especially as the issues that are being felt are quite transboundary. Um, the mining and the incision of a riverbed isn't stopping at political boundaries. Um, and this activity is happening more widely across basins more widely. Um, and this is work that uh, a colleague of mine at Newcastle, uh, Magda, has been leading on um, and has been developing as part of a GCRF project that we have with colleagues in Vietnam, um, looking to quantify this and automating the, the sort of detection of vessels from satellite imagery. And what Magda has been doing, um, is taking the sort of daily images from planet across the, Me the Mekong Delta in Vietnam uh, back to or up to 2017 at the moment, um, and then clipping them and, and tiling them and running them through um, some convolutional neural networks, as faster as CNN, um, machine learning algorithm or image um, classification and, and recognition algorithms to, to train this sort of um, neural network to identify riverborne traffic uh, and sand mining vessels within the images. Um, so got training and validation data sets, so we've got about 10,000 vessels um, identified uh, in those, independently tested against a couple of randomly chosen days. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, the effectiveness of this is basically, it seems to work, we're getting uh, F scores for those of you that, that understand some AI stuff of around uh, 0.8 up to 0.9. Um, so the models does a good job of identifying these vessels within, within the river channel. We can then run that um, through the archive. So here we've done 2018 to 2020, we're processing 2017 and 2021 at the moment. Um, and we, again, we're using this 100 meter buffer to remove inactive vessels. And then for each of the daily scenes that we have across the delta, we can produce heat maps of activity as we did for Cambodia. The issue here in Vietnam is that we have a lot of other large river traffic that gets picked up. So we have ferries, um, we have other sorts of transport vessels, we have cargo vessels. And so the model is being trained to identify vessels that are active within the sand mining industries, um, ground truthed with a series of UAV surveys that colleagues in Vietnam have undertaken for us, uh, which is one of those images in the background there, um, that let us, let us allow us to ground truth and actually train this model. So the heat maps we're getting there, 
vessel activity day by day, which you can then aggregate up um, to monthly aggregates and monthly heat maps uh, and show these changing patterns in activity throughout um, the multiple years. Um, we can then tie this and ongoing work within the project that's going on at the moment is, is going to tie this to indicators of change within the river, so changing riverbank uh, erosion rates, changing uh, incision rates in the bed, and also looking at the impacts therefore on socioeconomics and, and um, sort of socially relevant impacts on livelihoods and, and, and earnings and, and threat and risk and vulnerability. But this tool that we have now, we can, we can apply to different delta and different river environments. It's, it's set up and trained. We can, um, with a bit of tweaking of the parameters and a bit more ground truthing from, from different sites, we can apply this workflow that we now have. So we can start to look at not just the Mekong, but other large sandy deltas and rivers um, and really map and quantify the activities within these deltas at a, at a base and wide scale. This tool we developed with partners in Vietnam who will be using this hopefully to, to maintain active monitoring of these processes um, in, the, in the coming years. So finally, um, just to put this back into that sort of bigger picture context, um, it's, extraction rates at the moment, particularly on the Mekong, are, are not sustainable for extracting 10 times the amount of sand that's being delivered naturally by the river. Um, that isn't sustainable and the impacts are starting to manifest themselves across the lower Mekong in, in the delta and upstream um, in Cambodia. Uh, and unfortunately, the projections for society's use of sand is one of, of ever increasing need and, and demand. Um, and so the pressures on these systems to supply sand for society is, is only likely to increase. Um, that is obviously and the story that I've potentially painted here is, is one of negative environmental impacts. Um, but this study by, by Bendix and et al that, that came out um, earlier this month that links all the, the sand mining uh, activities and impacts to the range of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, as you see on the outside of this wheel here. Um, yes, the majority of them are, are negative, which are the red ones. However, there are several uh, in which the... Um, the linkages are synergistic and actually help to improve. So we, we can't forget that, that actually the mining of this material does provide an income for many people. So it helps pull people out of poverty. Um, it's important for infrastructure and development. So we need to think of ways to, to reduce or uh, in, better improve our, our reliance on, on other materials to, to force that. Um, so it's not, it's not entirely a negative picture, although from, from an environmental side of things, it, it's, it's clearly skewed one way. Um, but hopefully that just puts this in context. That this is an ongoing set of research around how we can better manage the global sand resources um, to, to ensure sustainable development um, across the world. Um, so just to sort of summarize and leave it there, um, We've shown using sort of new techniques and improved resolution of satellite imagery that the extraction of sand has increased in the lower Mekong, um, namely Cambodia over the past decade from 32 to 59 million tons a year. That's without any estimates for Vietnam or Laos, um, where extraction is also taking place. We hope to have estimates for Vietnam fairly soon. Um, the impacts are widespread and they're transboundary and they're affecting multiple different parts of the system, not just the hydrology, but, but the riverbeds and the salinity. Um, and those impacts don't respect um, political boundaries. So this is, this is a trans-boundary issue along with, say, water management itself. Um, and we now have the tools and the satellite imagery to, to map and monitor this across large temporal and spatial scales, not just in, in Southeast Asia, but but, but globally too. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And uh, very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chris. That's just a wonderful. Uh, so uh, 
let's see. Uh, if you have any question now, you can go ahead, unmute yourself, directly ask Chris. Okay, go ahead. Shahidu. Yeah. You can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much for this nice presentation. I have a number of uh, queries, uh, but at this moment, I'm asking you three questions. Who are the people uh, getting involved with this kind of activities? Is this activities uh, because we are facing the similar problem in our context? I am speaking from GBM Delta. You know, uh, similar problems is happening in our our situation. So one thing is that who are involved, and is the local uh, political uh, uh, politic politics and local political persons are in engaged with this kind of you know massive destructions of the riverbed, and how is the nature and characteristics of the regional policy re regarding the extraction of uh, you know, uh, send from the river bit. Thank you. I think, yeah, the, the really important set of questions when it comes to to, to managing this and and, and sort of regulating this in, in the long term. Um, it's as I'm sure you, sure you've known from from your own experience. It, it's it's tricky to say with any any certainty, and um, particularly within different countries, as the systems are different within within the within different countries um I, the the people on the ground that are actually doing the mining are, are locals they're the local people that are in, employed by um the, the bigger mining corporations to, to captain the vessels and, and, and do the dredging um the the ownership of those companies i i, I don't know anything about and, and i can't comment on on the sort of political um side of things on that it's um it's it's a in the mekong at least there is on the main stem there is little i guess what we might call sort of artisanal mining and small independent mining it is it is much more large companies that have the vessel and the infrastructure to to go and do it um so they they are run and operated by larger companies themselves that then employ the local people to do that. Hey, Chris, um, this is a general question. Um, we know every question has a both side, good or bad. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of sign money, um, that's always a challenge from a management point of view or policy maker almost it is impossible to completely stop the sand money because the local residents, people, they, they need to survive. They need some uh, channel resources for, you, for their income. Mm -hmm. So it's any way we can come out a number that, okay, 59 million tons too much. So if we just do, let's say uh, 29 or even 19 million tons, Okay, our river can can you know can survive. Is, is any of this kind of a number? Oh, you know, that's we should not take any sand from the you know what the message we we try to uh, if you know to the uh, policy maker. I I, th I think that's a, a vital question, not not just in this region but but around the world. It's um, and you're right it. As a society, we we rely on sand. We might not realize it in our day to day lives, but but it is fundamental to everything that that we do. Um, you can just look around your room and, and, and see sand everywhere if you look for it. Um, so we, we can't cut off the arm that supplies that. Um, that's that's not going to work. Um, so it is about coming up with a a way of. Yeah, either developing a number like that that you, you put an arbitrary number on, um, and say, well, if we we know the river is supplying six million tons a year on average, okay, there's in annual variations in that with with climate, but 
what what is the percentage of that that we feel we can live with um but that goes hand in hand with also then in wider society finding alternatives for sand as a material yeah. for construction um developing infrastructure and, and building designs that reduce the need for sand um that aren't just concrete um it's it's around I, there's there's efforts going on um working in cambridge i think it is where they're they're reducing the amount of sand in concrete and, and introducing some 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 plastic into that. Um, there's limits to how much of that you can do before the, the strength of the concrete becomes unfeasible. The building. Um, and there's 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 lots of efforts going on around the world to to find alternative construction materials um, yeah. that will help us reduce the amount that we need to take out. Um, but also looking for, for different sources. So it might be that, I know there's, there's a trade-off with all of this. Um, yeah. It might be that they, you increase the amount that comes from, from quarrying rather than from active river sources. So using crushed rock or alternative sort of M sand, manufactured sand, which is sort of crushed down um, rock to, to sand sort of grain sizes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it requires a, a a holistic approach to reduce that and not just arbitrarily putting a number on a, mm. on a very river. Good. Very good. You know, uh, in terms of in the river management, uh, many countries, the international rivers like Nile River, like, uh, you know, they have a quarter, quart, you know, in terms of water distribution, how much water per country can, can use. So uh, with your research, I think it can help us kind of uh, to come out uh, uh, like the sand quart, how much sand a country can, can remove, can extract like uh, from the laws, Cambodia or Vietnam. Some definitely take much more, some take less. There will be a big uh, argument, debate, you know, you take too much and nothing left for us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and we've seen that particularly on the, on the Mekong with, with the hydropower development and issues around water security and, and the transboundary nature of these large rivers um, that that any kind of effort or either by individual nations or or collective groups of these nations to to to, to offer some, or distribute water in that way yeah is always going to create a, a a debate and an argument around that yeah very good anybody uh, chris Christoph, yeah. go ahead. Hi, uh, sorry, I, I missed the, the beginning of your talk, but uh, maybe you 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 answered to my question before. But you you call it the dams as they retain a lot of sand and also fine grain sediment, the other fine grain sediments. Uh, do we have uh, an idea of the budget of how much for the Mekong, for example, these dams retain compared to what is extracted by man? In the lower reach, um, there are estimates. Uh, so I think the the estimates I put up on the slide were, were for the full build out. If if all the projected hydropower dams um, were to be built, um, the Mekong's lost around seventy percent of its sediment load over the past. 50, 60 years as a result of, of hydropower development and, and, and all the other impacts on, on the basin. Um, it's that that is probably again mostly focused on estimates of suspended load. Um, so again, the, the finer grained material with, with some fraction of sand in that. Um, I don't know of an estimate that's looked at the bed load fraction as a result of changes of those basin wide developments, but others on here, I know I can see Mark Guasha and, and, and Steve and Jim around, they might be able to, to offer some, some thoughts on that. But um, the, the values of, of extraction of sand that, that we're seeing there, it's, it's probably getting to the point of, of being fairly similar in terms of how much is being trapped behind those dams and, and how much is then being removed. Mm. Thank you. Very good. 
Very, very, very good. You know, uh, Chris, as uh, just you mentioned, the most recent uh, uh, results show the sediment reach to the delta area, the low ridge, it's only about 20, 24, 21 million tons. That's just too, too low. And if, if you count the sand removed from, from the delta, I guess maybe the net contribution from the main in terms of sediment, even maybe negative. That's a very alarming signal. This is why the coastal line retreats 30 meters a year. I mean, very bad situation, very severe. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, you, you see the, the numbers kind of disappear throughout the basin as, as they go down. It's, uh, yeah. it's quite shocking. Okay, uh, any, any question, comments to Chris? Uh, I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Mehmet. Um, I just missed the, the final part, but um, I was wondering if this mining has a, a direct relation with um, groundwater percolation. I'm not sure what is the, uh, the base of the, of the river, if it was uh, percolating uh, water to, to the groundwater storage, and this mining affect uh, this process or not. That, that's a really good question, and, and I don't think that's been explicitly looked at yet. I think that's an area where the work on mining and, and, and channel incision and the work on sort of subsidence and groundwater extraction are, are still fairly sort of separate and haven't quite come together there. But I, I think you're right, there's, there's certainly going to be some impact on the, the rate of refill or drawdown or hyperic flow that, that flows through the uh, aquifers in the delta as a result of, of changing bed levels uh, and also the, the increased salinity in the water. Hmm. Interesting. But that's, yeah, that's something that's certainly still open as far as I'm aware. Hmm. Cool. Hey, Mohammed, I know you from Egypt. Is there any sand mining problem over the, the lower Nile River? You know, um, uh, you mean uh, regarding groundwater or regarding no, no, the water, the sand mining, the like uh, what happened over the Mekong? Um, no, no, I, I don't think that uh, in Egypt there is sand mining. Oh, yeah, you have a lot of sand, they do not need the sand <laughs> from the river. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, anybody else? Uh, if not, I think thank you again, Chris. Oh, once again. Anybody, any audience, if you don't be feel shy, if you want to contribute a talk, please let us know. This is the community. We're working together. Okay. So please volunteer yourself and then we can schedule you in the spring 2020. And, uh, you know, thank you, Chris, again. Mm -hmm. So this, this talk is uh, also available now on the YouTube. Okay, cool.